going to kind of pick up where I left off last week, talking about the grace of God and thank God for that. I didn't quite finish that lesson up. I'm going to say a few more things about it and then turn a corner. But let me, let me back up a little bit and, and start with this idea, which you all know, and, um, and I'm thankful uh, for the grace of God. But you all know that it is his grace that we're saved. It's not of works. The Bible says if it were, we'd be boasting, we'd be bragging about, I'm holier than you, and it has nothing to do with that. We're saved by the grace of God. We'll never be good enough. We'll never work hard enough. We'll never give enough money. Whatever you want to say, name, we'll never be smart enough. It doesn't matter what we are. The grace of God is going to take us and it's to heaven. It's, that is what has saved us. And so sometimes we tragically think, that God is opposed to us until sometimes we, somehow we impress him. If we don't truly understand this concept of grace, we're not understand, what we'll try to do is work to appease God in some, in some ways. It, it is a rare thing, notice my word here, it's a rare thing to meet a religious person, not necessarily, can we say a Christian, but a religious person who is living like they are loved by God. Instead, when you meet religious people, you, you get the feeling that they suspect they aren't loved, and so they're trying, working feverishly, working as hard as they can to change things in, can we say, their religious behavior, to grit their teeth, to try to get God's attention, to try to get him impressed by them to see if they can get to heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, that will never work because none of that is necessary when it comes to salvation. It's the grace of God. So taking that religious route where I'm just going to try my best and I'm going to pray like this and I'm going to do these things because it puts this great weight of failure on us, but also it puts a great weight of pride on us. I think the Pharisees kind of had this down in the New Testament. They looked the part. They, they acted the part as far as on the, all, all the things they said were the, was the right things. But Jesus came and said, you're a bunch of snakes. That's what he said to them. They were religious, but they had no relationship with God. So deep down, I, I didn't, people sometimes really don't believe God's love was truly unconditional. And I'm going to run past this one more time and talk about this unconditional love for here for a moment. Unconditional means there is no condition to his love. And some of us don't like that in the fact of, because we're, you know, we're pretty good to God and we feel that we're better than that person out there murdering someone right now. And God has to love me more up in this pulpit, expounding the forever settled word of God, than he loves that person that's out there murdering someone. No, he doesn't. Unconditional. And so that means, again, no conditions. So how do you get God to love you more? You don't. What do you do to get God to love you less? Whatever you want, it doesn't matter. You're not going to get to let him to love you less. And that's hard for us to wrap our brain around. And in reality, we don't really like that sometimes. Because I'm not sure I want God to love them as much as he loves me. I'm acting like this and they're acting like that. Shouldn't I get better attention? Hmm. I think that's Pride. And why are we living this way? Why are we doing certain things? What, what, what makes this? We have to, this is extremely humbling, folks. Grace is humbling. To say there is absolutely nothing I can do. Well, don't tell me. You, you want to, I remember Brother Dugas, you wanted to get him fired up, just tell him that's not possible. Oh, my word. His nostrils would flare. It didn't, he'd work himself silly to prove to you, <laughs> don't tell me it ain't possible. I remember the, oh, I shouldn't tell this. The story was we couldn't have an apostolic seminary because all the people who, who sponsored them and the accreditation associations, they were, they were all Trinitarian and were oneness. And so they, there was no way they were possible. And they just kept saying, it's impossible. They can't. We can't. We can't. 
So whoever the cans were, he got plane tickets. Said, get on the plane. They all got on the plane, flew to New York or something, got out, sat down in front of the accreditation, said, because we're oneness and whatever, can we be accredited? They said, yes, we don't care anything about that. You just have to, whatever you say you're going to do is what you have to, what you're going to do. You follow your purpose and you're, that's what you're going to do. And you prove that you're going to do that. And you can be accredited. Gets them back on the plane, flames on and said, I don't want to hear another word about it. And we have UGSD today. However I got over there. Anyway, I miss him. But the point is, the, the, the thing about this is, is I can't do this on my own. And I, I, there's, uh, again, that's a, that's a, you know, if you think this through, it's a humbling thing to realize that. My tactics of getting God to love me through self-improvement and to work harder and to sing louder and to jump higher, moot point. Because when you come in here and if you decide to jump up and down with the music and you're just worshiping the Lord and talking in tongues and all that, wonderful. He loves you the same. As if you'd have slept in and not come to church. <sighs> I'm pushing hard on this. Because sometimes we do things for the wrong reasons. We're coming to church to make sure we're on the good side of God and to make sure He knows us and make sure He blesses us and make sure that He loves us. That's why you're coming. Maybe we ought to flip this and we ought to come to church simply because I am madly in love with Jesus. And I love the body of Christ. Maybe that's why we ought to come to church rather than, oh, he'll like me less or like me more. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This phrase in here, eternal life, is all about knowing God in the context of this intimate relationship in him. It's just, it's one of those things to where it's his love and his grace are lavished on me. How, and we're talking about having life. Remember, that's, that's our subject here. We're talking about just light is everywhere. And we're sometimes we're not coming alive and truly fully living. But this life that we have, how can we have that? By truly knowing Jesus Christ. By having a deep relationship with him. It is a powerful thing. When human beings begin to realize Jesus is inviting them to a relationship in which they can experience this unconditional love and this extravagant grace of God, that they have to do nothing to get it. God just wants to give it to you. And he's saying, whosoever will, let them come. That is a wonderful thing when, you come, when it comes to God. When I don't have to earn it, I don't have to beg for it. Matter of fact, he's asking me, come. Come to me, all ye that are heavy and weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come to me. Cast your yoke upon me. Come to me. That's what he is saying to us. What a privilege we have. Now again, we're in this life. The battle with sin and self-centeredness obviously continues even though God loves me in the midst of my sin, he loves me too much to leave me there. But when the question of whether he loves me is taken off the table, when you have that completely settled in your mind, that he loves me, no matter what I do, where I go, how I act, he loves me. When you can get that wrestle down, the game changes. Because I move from trying to entice love from God to just letting his unconditional love just flood me and flood my soul and become fully and truly alive in him. Matthew 23, 27 tells us, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, 
hypocrites. For you're like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but inside full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Jesus didn't come to dress up my deadness with religious decorations. His aim is to make me truly come alive in him. Ephesians 2, 1, and he, you, hath he quickened. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead. Dead in sins. He's quickened us together with Christ. And that beautiful phrase, by grace are you saved. Grace is the only way to truly be alive. It's the only way to live. I, I, I've got to taste grace. But to taste grace, to get a hold of grace, I have to admit my reality of my sin. This is where it gets very humbling. I've got to own up to my need for grace. I've got to say, I can't do this on my own. I need your help, Jesus. I can't cover myself. I need you to help me. That is humbling to us. Genuine humility doesn't fare too well with unbelieving circles but the same is also true of the religious crowd sometimes and because when I'm focused so much on my religion and how the nuts and bolts of my religion and how I'm going to do this and not do this and jump through man-made hoops to try to get to God I trip and fall every time but when I simply say I'm a sinner and I need Jesus that's when he will come to my rescue so embarking on this path of grace, instead of pandering to my pride and trying to find my way to God and trying to do it my way, it requires, yes, yeah, shoes of humility. It requires me humbling myself before him, no matter how impressive I may or may not be in everybody else's eyes. It doesn't matter what you think of me. What does he think of me? John 4, 6, but he giveth, oh, more grace. Where he, for he saith, God resists the proud. But if you humble yourself and fall at the foot of Jesus, he gives more grace. Well, I needed a whole bunch yesterday. That's okay. Well, I may need a whole bunch tomorrow. That's okay too. And then, you know, I may need a whole bunch again some other time. That's okay too. First Peter 5, 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed how? In religious garb. No. Be clothed with humility. Again, God resists the proud. But what's he do? Gives grace. There's no way you can have this, ladies and gentlemen, without being humble. There is no way. The scripture bears this out. There's no way we can get the grace of God without, his, without being humble before him. In my dead condition, I needed help and an infinite amount of help. The gospel is about God's infinitely gracious intervention into my story. But I'll never experience that intervention into my story that where I've stumbled and fallen and made a mess without honestly owning up to my desperation. Uh, sometimes, folks, it, and we have to be careful, and I'll try to be careful. But being raised in church and been around this all of my life, I've seen wild things in church. I've seen powerful things in church. I, I mean, I'm not sure something could happen and I'd get real shocked in church. It just. But if I'm not careful, it's just, I've been in this so long, it's just, this is just who I am. And thank God for that. But sometimes I forget that this is amazing grace 
If I'd been bitten by a poisonous snake, but for some strange reason I'm not wanting to admit that I'm bitten, <laughs> I'll only appreciate the anti-venom you want to give to me. I won't really appreciate it because I certainly won't use it if I won't admit I've just been bit by a snake. But if I know I've been bitten by a snake, bitten by a snake, and I'm writhing around in pain, and I know life is going out of me, and you come to me, and you say, here's some anti-venom that will save your life. I can't tell you how thankful I'm going to be to you and how appreciative I'm going to be to you. But again, if I'm not going to the first thing, admit that I need it, that I have to have it, then it's really no big deal. But if somewhere down inside of me I realize I've got to have his grace, I'm desperate for his grace, then I am so thankful for his amazing grace. Jesus can redeem and Jesus can love. Jesus can give me life. All of those statements of his are his, of his ability that, that, again, sometimes we so minimize because I'm scared sometimes we just get used to it and we're not fully grasping how much we desperately need of him. How long have I been hanging around the gospel? Do I still know who Jesus really is? Am I still blind to what he wants to do for me? Am I boxing Jesus into some prescription or some prescription area of my life and I want all of these different things for, for me and I'm not sure who he truly is in my life and where he fits in my life because I've just, I'm just used to it. Ladies and gentlemen, he wants to do exceeding abundant above all that we can ask or think. But he has to have the proper place in my life. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him is able to do those things I just quoted. Grace is free, but it's anything but cheap. It didn't cost me, it cost him everything. And so speaking of God's amazing grace, may he rescue us from the appearance of politely nodding and smiling when we may be yawning on the inside because we've heard it so many times. Deliver us, Lord, from merely going through the motions of listening to the gospel and what grace has done for us without truly submitting to and understanding the price that was paid. He's promised it to us. He's promised we could enjoy it. It's just to be able to accept it, we have to be in the right posture to accept it from him. That's the end of last week's. <laughs> Let's go on. We're talking about life everywhere. Truly coming alive and living. And part of this, I'm going to go through the next, uh, who knows how long is it going to take, next 50 years, uh, and I'm going to talk about different things. Tonight I want to begin, and we're going to talk about freedom. What a beautiful word. Political and social and national freedom is powerful. We're coming up on July 4th where we'll celebrate our independence, our freedom, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But personal freedom is even better. We yearn for freedom so deeply that sometimes if we're not careful again, our judgment can be muddled and we get sidetracked by a misunderstanding of what it really is, okay? And now again, when I say freedom, it's like, woo, freedom. Do what you want, when you want, go where you want. That's many times what we think freedom is. I'm here to tell you that's not exactly what it is. It's people adopting that, this free-for-all freedom, 
It is a result, uh, the resulting, the outcome, I can't think of the right words, but the outcome is just devastation. Paul wrote to some believers in the First Corinthian church, uh, uh, First Corinthians, in the Corinth church of First Corinthians. Um, you name the sin, and I think that church had a, dabbled in it. It was, the church was a mess. Uh, they had misdirected behavior. Uh, the people of Corinth practiced all kinds of things. So we come to, let's, let's look at 2 Corinthians 3, 17. It says, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.18 also says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Freedom, true freedom is experienced when we're being transformed to be more like Jesus. That is is how true freedom is experienced. We often try to figure out freedom in this physical realm and the freedom to really live and really enjoy our lives without seeing a connection to our spiritual realm also and our spiritual freedom. You cannot be physically and in the natural, whatever you want to say, free until you are spiritually free. They are in tandem. They are in conjunction. I'm never truly free until I experience Jesus' freedom for my life. Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He was addressing our core captivity issue here. He had come to, to deliver the captives. He had come to set at liberty those that are bruised. In our bondage, in our sinful nature, in our fallenness, we need that grace of God. We need the favor of God to set us free. Because without that, we are in bondage. Jesus emphasized that only if he sets you free, you're free indeed. Our sinfulness and our, our rebelliousness, and it's what holds us back from that ultimate freedom. A person cannot truly be free in Christ and at the same time have a stifled human existence. Okay? You can't go both ways here on this. I believe you cannot be truly free in this life now and not have a spiritual walk with Jesus. But I also believe if you do have the grace of God and have the, receive the, the gospel of Christ and if you have live an overcoming life, if you're, if you're doing those things and aligned up with him and he has the proper place in your life, I also believe your life here on earth is not going to be stifled either. So I think it goes both ways when it comes to understanding that he's going to make us free indeed. No matter how good I try to be, I cannot unlock the door and bring myself to life. I can't get out, can we say, of the prison cell. Then I come in contact with the gospel. I'm in a fallen, broken world. And even though the Bible says we're created in the image of God, I admit that my sinfulness is part of the brokenness, is part of the problem. It's consequences of my sin that has me shackled in a cell. Follow along, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed on all men, for all have sinned. When I begin to realize what these verses are saying to me, I begin to see Jesus in maybe hopefully a little bit of a different light, where he's not the founder of some religion. 
He's not just a, a good guy. He's not just, well, he was here, and yes, he's, he's a wonderful Savior, but it's much more than that. I begin to understand that he is a God that has come to give me life and to lead me out of a prison cell of sin. Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He took our place. 2 Timothy 1, 10, but it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought to life and immortality to light through the gospel. So yes, I recognize Jesus came, but his death was far more than just a martyr's death. His death was an in-my-place substitution death is what happened. His death was motivated because he is unconditional love. And he went, came to restore what had been lost because of sin. He was graciously paying my penalty, fulfilling my death sentence that I deserve because of sin. And I learned that how? By authentically and humbly receiving what Jesus had done for me and receiving that the death on the cross is a payment for me. So when I hear that story or I understand what he went through, that should have been me. That should have been you, but he paid our debt. John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. When I am saved, I just don't now have my name in a roll in some book somewhere of a church. When I am saved, I enter a complete new realm and receive a new status, one of restored, unencumbered relationship with God. I come truly alive. When Adam and Eve were in that garden and they fell in the sin and God walked through the cool of the day, Adam, Adam, where art thou? He's looking for Adam, trying to have that relationship with him. And Adam ran and hid and all of those things. That is what sin will do to us, cause us to hide from him where he is still seeking us. But when he comes and he restores that relationship that was broken because of sin and because of the gospel, what access we have, now we can come boldly to the throne room. Now we can approach him as our heavenly father. Now we can petition him, not out of fear or not out of shame, but because he has taken our place and he has now done something in our life to build and restore that relationship. The aimlessness gives way to purpose. The guilt relieved by forgiveness. Shame is being replaced by acceptance. Restlessness because of sin is now replaced by peace because of the gospel. Insight coming to replace the confusion. Hope comes to overcome despair. Completeness coming to occupy the emptiness. Significance overtaken superficiality. So no, it's not just, well, one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. No, it's one day when I was lost. I had no help, no hope. I was empty. I was broken. I had no purpose. I had no reason. I, had, I was confused. I was helpless. I was hopeless. He died up on the cross, and when he did that and took my place, now I have forgiveness and hope and peace and love. All of these wonderful things because of that. So my shackled heart in that prison cell can experience true freedom and only True freedom through the saving grace of Jesus. Here's the thing, though. It takes a lifetime 
to get rid of the prison garb by growing and maturing and learning to truly live. Your prison cell, your prison door has been unlocked by the gracious hand of God. The question I have tonight is, will you on a daily basis venture out of that place and truly live? Will I truly enjoy my relationship with God? Will I truly understand that he has set me free and I am free indeed? Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being recon reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Here's what I want you to hear from that scripture. If we only focus on Jesus' death, it leaves us in this in-between realm, can you say, of having our past sins forgiving and just waiting on the bus from heaven to take us there. <laughs> That's all it does. If we're focused, nothing, I'm not trying to diminish his death. I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with that. But if that's all we focus on, then he saved us, redeemed us, wonderful. All right, just hang on till, the, till heaven comes and gets us. But this verse tells me also that there has something to do with his life. So not just focused on his death, but focused on his life and what he has done for us. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So thank God I was buried in the name of Jesus and took on the name of Christ. But I'm also glad I came up a new creation in Christ. And even as Christ was raised from the dead, so I came up to walk in a newness of life. When I'm saved, I'm receiving, yes, his death. But not only his death, ladies and gentlemen, I get to receive the life part of this. And so while I'm here between heaven and her earth, and so while this transition and we have a earnest of our inheritance we talked about last week. While I'm here, I can truly be alive in Jesus Christ because of what he has done for me. I've got to learn to look at potential paths of behavior, however, and ask regarding my life, is this pattern or is this behavior compatible with my new life? Because if I decide to go a certain path and it's not compatible with when I have been raised to walk in a new life, I choose to go back in my prison cell and come into bondage of sin again. I don't always get it right. So when we sometimes do fall into sin, we choose to mess up. We, whatever the case may be, I take a sinful path and you go back into that prison cell and you sit there in that stagnation. Am I still loved by Jesus? Yes, get that completely off the table. You'll always be loved by him. Unconditional love. But the problem I have now is I'm back in a cell because of my sin. But understand, if we get this word picture, the door is not locked. You can come out of that cell anytime you want. You have that option. And so I often we go back into that prison cell because it's familiar or because we're trying to satisfy a longing in ourselves and not giving it over to God. There's many reasons we may go back into that cell, but instead of being free human beings, we're chaining ourselves to certain pursuits that can't address our God-sized longing and we get ourselves in trouble and we fall again and again into sin. It's actually a matter of me 
disobediently spending too much time in my cell and not choosing behavior that's compatible with this life. Again, what I'm trying to say here, and we'll move on just a few more minutes here, but what I'm trying to say is that he has come to give us life. He has come to give us freedom. And he that the Son has set free is free indeed. I have been buried in his name and I rise to walk in newness of life. However, the freedom can be taken away because of my choices I make. Some people look at us, look at my life, look at your life, and they say these words, and you've heard them say, you are in such bondage. I never find that because I'm truly free indeed. I can choose what I want. I can do what I want. There's some things I just choose not to do because it's not compatible with my new life. It's not compatible with what he has done in my life. Several years ago, this cracked me up. Congress, your tax dollars at work, passed a, a, a measure that was nicknamed the cheeseburger bill. The cheeseburger bill, it would prohibit class action obesity lawsuits against fast food companies. Why do we need that bill? Because several overweight Americans got together and had been filing complaints and a lawsuit against the fast food chains saying that these restaurants' food was too fattening and I'm fat because of them. So I'm going to sue them. Wisconsin Representative Jim Sessenbrenner explained, he was a sponsor of this bill. He says, this bill says, don't run off and file a lawsuit if you're fat. It says, look in the mirror because you're the one to blame. That's maybe kind of what behind, that's what be, what's behind Paul's famous instruction in Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. It's a choice. I can blame everybody I want to blame, but ultimately at some point... I need to pull the mirror up and look at myself and realize I'm the one to blame. I have to take the responsibility. He has set me free. He has taken my place. And so I have the, tr I, I have the ability and I have the choice to walk free in this life and truly have abundant life. So that means I also have the choice to go back into a cell and to be in bondage again. This is not reverse. This is not the world thinks this is, they think they're so free. I don't have to smoke. There's certain things I don't have to do to feel a longing in my heart because Jesus did that. I am free indeed by the blood of Jesus and by, his, by what he has done in, for me and I am so thankful for that. I will stop there. Let's all stand, and I will pick up there next week. No, I won't. Brother Burns, I think, is speaking next week. I'll be, somebody's getting married next week, and I, so, so I will be gone for that, but amen. Are you thankful for the grace of God? Amen. Nothing you can do to get it. Just humble yourself and say, I need it, and you'll get it. Thank him for that. Lord, I thank you. That you know our frame, you know everything about us, Jesus, and I'm thankful that you are here with us, Lord, that we, we, we can't get to you, but you came to us, and you have made a way of escape. I pray that you'd help us to never forget that this is an amazing grace, and because of that, Lord, you have truly set us free, and free indeed, but help us, oh God, to understand that you have called us to walk in a new life, a life of freedom, but we have the choice, Lord, to go back into bondage, and I pray that you'd help us to be overcomers. I pray that you would help us to strive to be more like you. 
Help us to do your work, to do your will, to be like you. We'll give you praise, Lord, because you have done great things and you're a great God. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each one of you.